100 miles from South America, 1,500 miles from Polynesia, Easter Island, also called Rapa Nui, is a tiny speck of land in the center of the Pacific Ocean. It's only 11 miles long by 7 miles wide. So one of the many mysteries of this amazing island is how anybody found it in the first place. But we know that Polynesians did find it. Carbon-dated remains tell us they settled the island sometime in the 5th century AD. Even to people used to the South Pacific, Easter Island must have seemed like a paradise. Thickly forested, it had large freshwater ponds. The soil was fertile, and the ocean teeming with fish. For centuries, those first Easter Islanders thrived here. By the 14th century, their numbers had grown to almost 20,000. But then, something went wrong. When the Dutch explorers arrived here in 1722, they found a starving population and a struggling culture. Something significant had happened, something which decimated the people of Rapa Nui and all but destroyed their traditions and culture. There were fewer than 2,000 people on the island. Many of the great statues called Moai had already been abandoned. Ecologically, the island was devastated. There was hardly a tree to be seen. What had happened? To explore the enigma of Rapa Nui, I'm going to have to start at the beginning. The Moai are just one of many mysteries here on Easter Island. Another is how did the people who made these ever get here in the first place? Finding this tiny speck of an island in the middle of the Pacific would be like finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. It would either take an incredible stroke of luck or an unbelievable amount of skill. In the 5th century AD, Polynesians escaping warfare in their overpopulated homelands set sail from Tahiti and the Marquesas. Their explorations must rate among the most astonishing in world history. In outrigger canoes, with no compasses or maps, they set out across the vast southern Pacific in search of new lands. They discovered New Zealand to the south and Hawaii to the north. But their most amazing feat was to canoe 1,500 miles across the open Pacific and find the tiny speck we call Easter Island. How did they do it? To find out, I've come to meet master navigator Hugo Tiave He. <laughs> that is great. Hugo? Hey, Josh. Great to meet you. Hugo has brought his friends from the Rapa Nui Outrigger Club. They regularly race in outrigger competitions all around Polynesia, so I'm in good hands. We push off from the beach and head for the open ocean. All right. Starting to get the hang of it. The outrigger canoe is the classic Polynesian vessel. Polynesians have always lashed an outrigger or float parallel to their canoes. As we get out into the rougher water, I find out why. Without it, we'd be tipped over in seconds. But before long, we get into the swing of things and the canoe is really moving. So, I can't say I'm an expert, but I've learned it's all about the rhythm. You just gotta make sure you keep in pace with the people around you. Pull hard enough and you go forward. But we've only gone a few miles. I can't imagine what it'd be like to be out here for weeks at a time going thousands of miles. Hard work. I think about the scene 1,500 years ago when those early Polynesian navigators set out from the Marquesas and headed east across the Pacific. Legend has it their leader was a king named Hotu Matua. What baffles me is how, after weeks at sea, he and his people were ever able to find the tiny speck of land we now call Easter Island. I put the question to Hugo. So despite not having things like compasses and maps, sailors like Hotumatua would have come here using a lot of different tricks to get across the sea safely. Of course. Like at night time, 
They put their feet in the water, they, they can feel a big swell that it goes into the land. At the impact that it hit the land, it brings, send back a little waves. What Hugo tells me is astonishing. Many miles from land, Hotumatua and his navigators could detect the tiny waves that bounced back from the shore. They were alert to every variation of wind and current. They observed the movement of birds and stars. Putting all this information together, they could find their way across vast expanses of ocean. Finally, one day in the 5th century, Hotumatua and his people came ashore on the island that would later be called Rapa Nui, Easter Island. One can only imagine what it was like to spend weeks, possibly even months, at sea before all that navigational skill pays off and they find this beautiful island, a place that they can call home for the next thousand years. Polynesians had been sending out exploration teams for centuries. When these intrepid groups of men found islands, they would return with news of their discoveries. Then, colonization parties would set out with women, children, plants, and animals to take possession of the new lands. Landing, Hotumatua would have called on the ancestors to recognize his claim to this new land. Hotumatua must have realized this was a place where his people would thrive and prosper. What he couldn't know was that one day, disaster would befall them. Coming up, I explore an ancient quarry, wrestle a moai, and carve my own, all in search of clues to the mysterious catastrophe that overtook Easter Island. When Europeans first arrived on Easter Island in 1722, they found a treeless landscape that had been ecologically and socially devastated. What had happened? I've been exploring this tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, searching for answers. Out on the open sea, I came to appreciate one of the most amazing feats of exploration in world history the discovery of Rapa Nui by Polynesian navigators in the 5th century AD. But a thousand years later, an environmental disaster overcame the island. Why and how? I've heard a surprising theory that it was the intensive production and transport of the island's famous statues which may have precipitated the ecological crisis. To investigate, I decide to visit the largest group of statues on the island. They're eight miles from Easter Island's only town, Hangaroa. One of the best ways to get there is on horseback. I finally arrive at the Moai called Tongariki. They're amazing. I've arranged to meet someone here who I hope can help me understand them. Sergio Rapu is a well-known archaeologist and a native of the island. Hello. These are incredible. Yes, these are wonderful work of our ancestor. How did they make these? Well, they were carved out of a volcanic tuff with some very simple tools at the quarry and then brought here. So there's a quarry where they actually harvested this rock? Oh yeah. It's, in yeah. fact, it's just right there. Can we go take a look? Sure. The quarry is only a few minutes' ride away, on the side of one of the island's many extinct volcanoes. We leave the horses at the base of the volcano and start to climb. When we get to the rim, we're greeted by an amazing sight. The crater is now a lake, and around it are hundreds of unfinished stone heads. <laughs> it's just crazy. They're like just sticking out of the ground everywhere. How many moai are there? Over the island, I think there are about 900. 900. And they all come from this quarry? There are about 300 still here, mm -hmm. and the rest distributed, scattered all over. And are they all about this size? No, it varies from a couple of meters yeah. all the way to 66 feet tall. Right. It's like a giant abandoned factory, 
There are statues all over the crater, some standing, others lying down, and they're massive. Sergio tells me that for centuries, statue production was going on almost non-stop at this quarry. The place would have been swarming with people carving and transporting moai. And then for some reason, they seem to have put down their tools and stopped. Why? Before coming here, I knew about these statues or moai, but what I didn't know was how enormous they are. Remember, half of this guy is still buried in the ground below. At the time that these were built, aside from the tops of the trees or the masts of their ships, these would have been the biggest things on the island. Using Stone Age technology, creating and transporting the gigantic moai must have absorbed an amazing amount of time and energy. They must have been really important to the people of Rapa Nui. Does anyone know what they represent? They represent the ancestors. Uh, the cult of ancestor was practiced here, and they are the focal point of activities, ceremonial activities, mm -hmm. and they are ceremonial centers for the lineage. Sergio explains to me that whenever an important chief died, a statue would be made in his honor. The Moai didn't just represent him, it was him. His spirit was there in the stone. His face looking out over the village of his descendants. The Moai were the dead of Rapa Nui, brought back to stand guard over the living. So I now know why they made them, but just as fascinating is how they made them. Carving and transporting these massive statues must have been a real feat, even more so when you consider how many were produced. There are 900 of these statues still on the island, but these are just the last generation of Moai. Sergio tells me the remains of many earlier Moai have been found. So the people of Rapa Nui were producing statues on an almost industrial scale. Could this somehow have precipitated the ecological crisis on the island? I need to know more about the production of these Moai. Sergio takes me to meet master carver Jose Rapu. Look, he's making a moai. Oh, yeah. He's using rock, so this is a traditional technique. That's right. So they use the peak made out of uh, basalt, which is very dense material. That's uh, just like the original. It wore out, of course, in the process of making the moai. So this one's almost done. It's, yeah, but it still yeah, works. It still works. Is it okay if I give it, a ch give it a shot? Yeah, I can. So you just hit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So because it's harder, it just crumbles away. The softer stone that's crumbles right. away. Yeah. And that's how you can just shape it. So if I wanted to take some off here. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty easy. There you go. Yeah, you're becoming a Rapa Nui sculptor. Yeah. I'm an apprentice under the master. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out to be easier than I'd imagined. Just very time consuming. Sergio tells me the key was teamwork. So, Jose is the master artist of this moai. He would have a team of people working under him. Exactly. The whole community involved. Now, how long would it take to make a moai? Approximately a year. It's a lot of hard work. Huh. Maybe I'll help Jose. Yeah. Maybe we'll knock it down to six months. From Jose, I learned some of the basic carving techniques used to create the moai. But there's nothing here which could produce an ecological disaster. Could it be the transport of the statues which was to blame? We head back to the quarry. Sergio shows me one of the most amazing sights of the island. Massive, half-finished moai, some over 60 feet tall, still encased in the rock from which they were being carved. Okay, here we have one of the 300 moai still attached to the quarry. And yet they're getting loose out of these corners. So they're cutting down. And uh, eventually, they will be, it will be slide down to the foot of the hill. So this whole rock was carved out over the years. And then this artist started like this. Yeah. And just carved out the face. Looks like he started on the face and never finished the body. Uh, that's right. That's right. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, that's just a lot of work. That's what seems even more <laughs> difficult and challenging is they actually have to now slide it all the way down to the flatlands. The back of the moai will shape like a canoe. 
Uh -huh. So it kind of slides smoothly on the debris of the carving that they have accumulated at the end of the moai mm -hmm. to create a, a ramp. And with gravity, a little pushing, that will get uh, the moai down to the ground. To be able to carve these massive moai and get them to the bottom of the quarry was remarkable enough. Moving them across the island strikes me as an even more amazing feat. Once they'd been slid down the ramp of debris, they had to be transported up to eight miles. How did they do that? I wonder if the moai I see lying on the ground, apparently abandoned in transit, hold clues to how they were transported. This is huge. How much are this way? This is about uh, 50 tons. 50 tons? 50 tons. As we keep walking, we come across moai after moai, all lying face down in a straight line. This is a really big one, Yeah. much larger than the last one. Sergio, I've noticed that all of the moai we've seen seem to be on the same line leading to the quarry. That's right, because this is one of the main roads of the moai. We know of four of them at least. These roads were carefully constructed and leveled to make transport of the statues easier. So it's indicated it fell off through transportation. But I still want to know how the people of Rapa Nui could move 50 ton stones. And then we have more up here. Sergio has organized a demonstration for me with a replica of one of the smallest moai. So the moai move horizontally. He says that at first, archaeologists assumed the moai were moved lying on their back, using a system of logs as rollers. So it's very easy to move on the flat ground and with the wood attached. I can see how this could deplete the timber of such a small island. Okay. So yes, you can certainly move a moai like this. Yeah. Yeah? But is this really how it worked? Every moai I've seen is lying face down. Huh. Now there's other Sergio tells me that this added. fact made some archaeologists yeah, believe that they were not transported face up after all, but lying face down just as they were found. Right. But, but that too seems down. problematic. Like for me, because if this is where they're putting in all their effort, their artistic effort to make it beautiful, and then if you're sliding it on its face, yeah. it would destroy all that hard work. You're absolutely right. It doesn't make sense that you spend so much energy for that mm -hmm. and then take the risk of putting the moai face down. But Sergio has his own theory about how the moai were transported. I believe that the moai was uh, standing in a very good position to work. This they seems unbelievable. How, it does, so how could you transport a 50-foot tall piece of stone vertically? Now, normally, you know, 60 tons, yeah. <laughs> we can do that by ourselves. Okay. We have found moai that weighed over 80 tons that has been moved from here all the way to the final destination in eight or nine kilometers. So what we have here then is a moai completed, mm -hmm. the back and the front, but the base of the moai were never completed at the quarry. On the contrary, at the quarry, the base of the moai will be carved in such a way that allow for the moai to tilt a little bit like this mm -hmm. and be pull forward, kind of walking, so you can have a tilt and pull type things. So you move it like a refrigerator? It's moving like a refrigerator, but the base of the moai was accommodated for that purpose, for that function. So they, they shape the bottom of the stone? They shape it. To facilitate this motion? Exactly. If it's correct, Sergio's theory is astonishing. Teams of men pulling on ropes were able to set up a carefully controlled rocking motion, which walked the upright moai forward. It seems totally counterintuitive, but the curved bases of the statues in transit is compelling evidence. If the moai were transported horizontally, why to bother to prepare the base of the moai in such a way that allow the rocking? And that allow for the moai to tilt a maximum, perhaps five or six degree, mm -hmm. one side or the other. And to pull this, it required tremendous coordinations of the rope movement. So the ancient people would use uh, shunt. They will shunt, and the rhythm of the shunt will allow the people to properly pull at the right uh, second. So they're chanting and singing as the moai. Exactly, moving. they're chanting and singing, and the moai will go like that.
Many years ago, Rapa Nui elders told Sergio the Moai walked across the island. He didn't believe it then, but he does now. Perhaps the Moai really did walk. If this is true, it has huge significance for understanding the disaster which apparently overtook the island in the centuries before Europeans arrived. I wondered if Moai transport demanded so much timber that it could have deforested the island. But transporting the Moai vertically would have required very little timber. The Moai and the ancestor cult could not have deforested the island alone. There must have been something else behind the crisis on Easter Island. Coming up, the tragic fate of Rapa Nui and the desperate attempts of its people to save themselves. So they were actually practicing cannibalism. Easter Island is the remotest inhabited island on Earth. I'm trying to discover the fate of the Polynesians who populated it. Pollen analysis has shown that when Hotumatua and his pioneers arrived in the 5th century AD, the island was thickly forested. A thousand years later, it was almost bare, and many of the Moai were abandoned. What was behind these events? I'm hoping that Easter Island specialist Jose Letelier can shed some light on the mystery. He wants to show me important evidence that by the 16th century, people were fortifying themselves underground. Against what? This is the entranceway to a very extensive cave system which runs throughout this area. These caves are in fact ancient lava tubes through which rivers of molten rock once flowed from volcanoes now long extinct. Well, here we are, and you can see we've got walls here on the front of the lava tube. Mm -hmm which are obviously some sort of uh, fortification. These remains show us that these caves were used in such a way that allowed people to defend themselves. If you look over here, we have the cooking oh, yeah, the oven. Fire pit. These yeah. things were typically located here near the exterior of the cave so that, of course, the smoke doesn't fill the inside of the cave. So a lot of seating areas, as you can see here. So when does this home date to? Well, believe it or not, you'd think that people would begin to occupy caves very early on, mm -hmm. but in fact, what we have happening here is that caves are used uh, in a later part, probably around the 16th century. There might be clues underneath the ground. So a full thousand years after they settled the island, and 200 years before the arrival of Europeans, the people of Rapa Nui were starting to live in caves. I wonder if this had something to do with the deforestation of the island and the abandonment of the Moai. They all seem to have happened at the same time. Of course, this took place at a time when things were beginning to fall apart here on the island. We have a big battle over the resources. They're in a very remote place and they can't escape. You said they're, they're actually fighting each other. They're at war amongst each other. Finally, the pieces of the puzzle begin to come together. Jose explains to me that by the 16th century, warfare and raiding were endemic on the island. With no wood to build their great seagoing outriggers, the people of Rapa Nui were cut off from the rest of the world, and even fishing became difficult. As the population grew, food shortages set in. Were the people of Rapa Nui victims of their own success? Here on this remote island, they created one of the most remarkable megalithic cultures in the world. But as they thrived, they were unknowingly sowing the seeds of their own downfall. With overpopulation, agricultural land became scarce and depleted. Forests were cut down. The end result was a vicious cycle of ecological degradation and bitter conflict over land and food warfare began to tear apart Rapa Nui society. At the height of the conflict, when the people are moving into the caves, archaeologists estimate that 20,000 people were living on this island. That's the size of a small town or an average American university. And given that their parents, their grandparents, and their great-grandparents all grew up here, these people must have been incredibly familiar with, if not related to, the others on this island. So when the killing began, it must have been terrifying. 
It must have felt like they weren't just living on this island. They were trapped here. Rapa Nui folk history, as told to early European settlers, was full of bloodshed and conflict. Location names all over the island commemorated grisly events, like the place they call Anakai Tagata. I want to find out just how far the violence went, so I arranged to meet Sergio Rapu once again. And Sergio, I have heard that this is called the Cannibal Cave. The Rapa Nui name for this cave is Anakai Tangata. It has two meanings, really. One is that the cave where the people eat, and the other meaning is the cave where people are eaten. So was cannibalism yeah. actually practiced here? Given the desperate situation of the 15th, 16th century, it's very likely that some kind of cannibalism did occur. There was a real scarcity of everything, especially food. And so it could very well be that cannibalism was present at that time. Whether they really practiced cannibalism or not, the picture I'm getting of Rapa Nui society in the 15th and 16th centuries is a very grim one. It's backed up by a reproduction, I find, of a new type of moai created at that time. As the people of Rapa Nui faced the new priorities of survival, moai construction ceased. But one craftsman created a new art form, which captured the grim realities of their situation. It was called the Moai Kavakap. These skeletal, grimacing figures carved in wood were created only in the warfare years on Rapa Nui, when starvation and death must have seemed ever-present. They're small because by this time, only small pieces of wood were available on the island. They are certainly a far cry from the stout, serene Moai, which were the protective ancestors of old. Was there nothing the people of Rapa Nui could do to stop the island slide towards chaos? Coming up, their final game plan for survival, the Birdman cult. Go down this cliff? Right. Did they use ropes? No. The story of Easter Island which I've been piecing together is an amazing saga of heroism and tragedy. The Polynesians who first discovered the island in the 5th century AD must have thought they discovered paradise. But their idyllic existence here did not last forever. Easter Island is very small and its resources strictly limited. As the population grew, it began to deforest the island. In time, there was no wood left to build the great ocean-going canoes, which were their contact with the outside world. Trapped on the island, the people of Rapa Nui began to fight over their ever-diminishing resources. Long before the arrival of Europeans, starvation and warfare ravaged the island. But I've heard of an attempt by the islanders to remedy their situation. This is the ceremonial village of Orongo. On that side, we have the crater of an extinct volcano. And over here on this side, a thousand foot cliff dropping down to shark infested waters. It was here in this unusual location where the people of Rapa Nui may have created a solution to their problems. Hi, I'm hoping archaeologist Sergio Rapu Good can tell you. me more about it. How are you? This is a great spot. Oh, yeah. I've heard that this place, this village Orongo, is where something special was created. Well, this is the place of the Birdman cult. The Birdman cult was a solution to the redistributions of resources. And the leaders, the warriors, would gather here once a year to compete to have a political and economic control of the island. Every year, the nesting of the sooty tern, a migratory seabird, signaled the inauguration of a new Birdman ceremony. Clan chiefs and their warriors gathered at Arongo for a contest to decide which clan would rule the island for the next year. Before the Birdman cult, there had never been a unified authority on the island. Each clan worshipped its own ancestors and looked after its own territory. When the clans went to war, 
There was nothing and no one to stop them. Sergio and other archaeologists believe the Birdman cult was developed at the height of the conflicts as a way to try and control them. This almost suicidal contest was witnessed by the early Europeans. So they would start here at Arongo. That's right. And they'd actually they'd go down this cliff. Exactly. The contest started when the clan chiefs sent their best warriors racing down the thousand-foot cliff below Arongo. For weeks, the men would prepare for their ordeal. They'd carry reed floaters to help them with the grueling, mile-long swim to the more distant of two offshore islands, or motus. Oh my god. Look at that. Sergio, they'd go down this cliff? Exactly. And then swim out to that island. Balanced precariously on their floaters, the swimmers had to battle ocean swells and powerful currents. Exhausted, they would finally climb onto the motu, where the sooty tern nested. For the people of Rapa Nui, the sooty tern was a magical bird. In reality, it migrates thousands of miles across the ocean every year. But the islanders knew only that it arrived from beyond the horizon. They believed it came straight from heaven. They thought it was sent by the gods. Its egg was a symbol of cosmic fertility and power. Once contestants found an egg, they had to race all the way back to Orongo with it. And then they swim back. Swim back with the egg. And they climb back up this. They climb up here. Wow, that's a contest. The clan chief of the first warrior to return with an egg would then have authority over the island and its resources for the year. He became the Birdman until the sooty terns nested once again and the contest started over. So through this contest, that king and then that clan would be the rulers for the next year. That's right. It's a way of validating a new power, a new way of resolving the conflict for people who are going hungry and having no way to escape from the island. If Sergio is right, the people of Rapa Nui invented this amazing ritual as a way to limit their conflicts and conserve their island's resources. Coming up, I follow in the footsteps of the Birdman contestants and find out if they really help solve Rapa Nui's problems. If you see any sharks, let me know. My investigations on Easter Island are coming to a head. I've learned that the islanders created an ecological catastrophe, which led to years of chaos and violence. By the 15th century, Rapa Nui society was staring into the abyss. Its response was the amazing Birdman cult, an annual contest to establish a supreme leader over the island's warring factions. Contestants raced down a 1,000-foot cliff and swam through shark-infested waters to an island a mile off the coast. The clan of the first man back then had control over the island for the next year. It is this amazing ceremony which I'm going to investigate now. Above all, I want to find out if the Birdman cult really could have remedied the island's desperate predicament. What Sergio said about the Birdman cult was fascinating. So I've come here to the port of Hangaroa, a small town on Easter Island. My goal is to take a boat and go to the base of the cliff and see what challenges these contestants actually faced. From Hangaroa to the cliffs of Orongo is only about a mile, but it's an exhilarating boat ride. 
One thing that I wish you could experience is the quality of the air and the water here. It has got to be the cleanest air on the planet. We're so far from other lands which could pollute it that just breathing here, this is what it must have been like 500 years ago when the people were making the Moai. This place is so unpolluted. The water is cobalt blue. And I've never seen water that clear. It's astounding. Down here on the water, everything looks a little different. You know, from up there, it didn't look like it was that far away. But it's a pretty good distance. I guess that's about a mile from the shoreline to the Motu. And another thing that I didn't realize is these waves, there's these huge swells coming in. And they're only gonna build as the morning goes on into midday. So this contest is starting to look like a much more physical feat than I was prepared for. Should be fun. Finally, we arrive at a point between the base of the cliff and the motu of the sooty turn. Sergio and I were up there on those rocks. And I'll tell you, from down here, it doesn't look any better. This is an insane attempt. Today, it's not allowed. It's a park, you can't even approach the cliff. It's illegal to try and come down it. So, if I wanted to do this contest, that part, I can't. But the swimming part, I can. With every passing minute, the accomplishment of those Birdman competitors strikes me as even more amazing. Their physical stamina must have been astonishing. And now it's my turn. Uh, figure out how to use this thing. Let's try in the water, the first thing I discover is just how difficult it is to balance on the reed floater. I was counting on this thing really helping me, but just staying on top of it is hard enough. It's gonna take me a while to figure this one out. And I've got a long way to go. Do I look like a seal waiting for a shark to come eat me? That'd be my only concern. The immediate challenge is the strong current, always pushing me back towards the cliff. Keep thinking off. Almost there. Almost there. And you look back and you go, no, I'm not. I've now been in the water for about an hour. Because of the current, I've hardly made any progress, and I'm getting seriously tired. I think I may have to face the reality that I'm not gonna get there. I'll give it my best shot. Those contestants must have been in great physical condition, and I'm guessing they would have held the contest on days with weaker currents. I'm getting nowhere. I wonder how many hours it would have taken the swimmers to cross the strait to the Motu. I also wonder if they all made it. However fit they were, I know now what a dangerous undertaking it was. Bruised and battered from the climb down the cliff, soaking wet and exhausted from the swim, the contestants would arrive here at the Motu, the halfway point in their journey. Before they can make the trip back, they'd have to search this island for an egg. There are birds all over this island. Look, there's frigate birds hovering over us in the sky. There's this little one right here. Come over, look at this guy. This is not the sooty turn. This is not the bird that they were looking for. What they would have to do once they reached the Motu was find the right egg, put it safely into their, probably their headdress, and then make the swim back to the mainland. After another few hours in the water, the warriors who survived would run up the last stretch of cliff to the clan chiefs waiting for them. I guess they were motivated by the knowledge that so much hung on their performance. Supreme power for their clan over the whole island for a year. but I still have a lot of questions about the Birdman cult. I've discovered what an astonishing feat it was physically, but did it really unify the island and preserve its resources? I asked Rapa Nui native and archeologist, Sergio Rapu. From a pure survival perspective, the Birdman cult succeeds and keeps the Rapa Nui people alive until the Europeans arrive, is that correct? 
Yeah, that was the end of the prehistory of Rapa Nui, and the Rapa Nui were surviving, uh, perhaps uh, much more impoverished than the first time they fir arrived to this island, and they were abandoning the, totally the cult of the ancestor, uh, but uh, they were alive. Mm -hmm. Sergio tells me the Birdman cult became everything, and they abandoned their ancestor cult. The first Europeans to arrive here in 1722 found a demoralized and starving people living among the fallen statues. It sounds to me like the Birdman cult was too little, too late. The people of Rapa Nui were helpless to stop the processes they'd set in motion centuries before. I think that perhaps the lesson of Rapa Nui is one that the world today should be paying attention to. The people who settled this island were hyper aware of their environment. They could detect the slightest change in the wind, the currents of the sea, the flight paths of the birds, and yet they completely missed the destructive path that they were set upon. It's hard not to see the fate of Easter Island as a haunting parable. Still, after centuries of disastrous settlement, the islanders are beginning to thrive once again. People like Sergio are taking hold of their heritage. The ancestors seem to be coming back to life. Good morning, Joshua. How are you? Great. Look at these. Yeah. They look completely it's, different. You can see the ancestor alive here. Hi. Sergio has discovered their original coral eyes. That's right. Now, I know that you're a modest man, but you're the one who actually discovered the eyes, correct? We discovered the meaning of the eyes. Sergio is being modest. Everybody used to believe the Moai had empty eye sockets, symbolizing death. In 1978, Sergio's team found hundreds of small coral fragments beneath the moai. He couldn't figure out their significance until he started to fit them together. That must have been an exciting discovery, when you had all these coral pieces and you didn't know what they were for, and then all of a sudden, their eyes, right? Wasn't it is wonderful because you actually you give a total different appearance to the monument, mm -hmm. and that's what they used to look like. And it's also bringing a, a very powerful meaning to us. Our elders will always refer to the Moai as the living face of the ancestor. So by putting so the eyes, put these eyes in. in the face, you're actually giving sight to your ancestor. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. The Moai with eyes, just as the ancients would have seen them, have never been filmed before. To see them staring out over their island, guarding it once again, seems like the perfect end to my exploration of the astonishing saga of Rapa Nui. Fifth century AD, Polynesians escaping warfare in their overpopulated homelands set sail from Tahiti and the Marquesas. Their explorations must rate among the most astonishing in world history. In outrigger canoes, with no compasses or maps, they set out across the vast southern Pacific in search of new lands. They discovered New Zealand to the south and Hawaii to the north. But their most amazing feat was to canoe 1,500 miles across the open Pacific and find the tiny speck we call Easter Island. How did they do it? To find out, I've come to meet master navigator Hugo Tiave He. <laughs> that is great. Hugo? Hey, Josh. Great to meet you. Hugo has brought his friends from the Rapa Nui Outrigger Club. They regularly race in out... When the Dutch explorers arrived here in 1722, they found a starving population and a struggling culture. Something significant had happened. 
something which decimated the people of Rapa Nui and all but destroyed their traditions and culture. There were fewer than 2,000 people on the island. Many of the great statues called Moai had already been abandoned. Ecologically, the island was devastated. There was hardly a tree to be seen. What had happened? To explore the enigma of Rapa Nui, I'm going to have to start at the beginning. The Moai are just one of many mysteries here on Easter Island. Another is how did the people who made these ever get here in the first place? Finding this tiny speck of an island in the middle of the Pacific would be like finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. It would either take an incredible stroke of luck or an unbelievable amount of skill. In the figure competitions all around Polynesia, so I'm in good hands. We push off from the beach and head for the open ocean. All right. Starting to get the hang of it. The outrigger canoe is the classic Polynesian vessel. Polynesians have always lashed an outrigger or float parallel to their canoes. As we get out into the rougher water, I find out why. Without it, we'd be tipped over in seconds. But before long, we get into the swing of things and the canoe is really moving. So, I can't say I'm an expert, but I've learned it's all about the rhythm. You just gotta make sure you're keeping pace with the people around you. Pull hard enough and you go forward. But we've only gone a few miles. I can't imagine what it'd be like to be out here for weeks at a time going thousands of miles. Hard work. I think about the scene 1,500 years ago when those early Polynesian navigators set out from the Marquesas and headed east across the Pacific. Legend has it their leader was a king named Hotu Matua. What baffles me is how after weeks at sea, he and his people were ever able to find the tiny speck of land we now call Easter Island. I put the question to Hugo. So despite not having things like compasses and maps, sailors like Hotumatua would have come here using a lot of different tricks to get across the sea safely. Of course. Like at night time, they put their feet in the water, they can feel a big swell that it goes into the land. At the impact that it hit the land, it brings, send back a little waves. What Hugo tells me is astonishing. Many miles, 100 miles from South America, 1,500 miles from Polynesia, Easter Island, also called Rapa Nui, is a tiny speck of land in the center of the Pacific Ocean. It's only 11 miles long by 7 miles wide. So one of the many mysteries of this amazing island is how anybody found it in the first place. But we know that Polynesians did find it. Carbon dated remains tell us they settled the island sometime in the 5th century AD. Even to people used to the South Pacific, Easter Island must have seemed like a paradise. Thickly forested, it had large freshwater ponds. The soil was fertile and the ocean teeming with fish. For centuries, those first Easter Islanders thrived here. By the 14th century, their numbers had grown to almost 20,000. But then, something went wrong. 